packages to try and identify cancers earlier so that cure, even if we identify them early, we can cure them. Dr. Prithvi Mohandas was involved in not only putting the team together, but also in making sure that we got the best possible technology. And uh, the true beam is the result of hard work both from him and his mother. And uh, we thought it would be ideal if he tells us about the role of true beam in cancer cure. Dr. Prithvi Mohandas. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandy, and who better to talk about one of uh, Mrs. Malika Mohandas's babies than another baby of hers, me. So um, I would like to welcome the honorable chief guest. Uh, I'm told that I unfortunately am not one of the people who can call him anything else apart from Mr. Nathavernakis. The words excellency are reserved for Mrs. Nathavernakis when he enters the house. Uh, Lucy, Jack, His Excellency Mr. Kurunziza, uh, con uh, Honorary Consul uh, from Japan, our guests from the Seychelles, ladies and gentlemen. So here we are at the Miot Hospitals Chennai, and a lot of you who have followed this journey started by one of the fathers of orthopedics, would have hardly realized that we would get to where we have today. So this is what it looked like in 1995. And you can see, see if you look very carefully at that already balding man scratching his head, looking at that little brook flowing through the middle of the land uh, before he had actually bought the land beyond that. So it started there. And it grew to a 100-bedded hospital in 1999, which specialized in trauma and a few other specialties. And I was very lucky to change my mind and my wife and come back in 2007. Um, and I hope inject some freshness uh, into an already robust organization. So, I traveled throughout the length and breadth of this country to rediscover what I already knew was a very great country. And I found, after visiting institutions of great repute, that the people with the least amount of hope are given the worst possible position in these great hospitals. So, I went to Bombay, I went to Calcutta, I went to Chandigarh, I went to Bangalore, and I found that people who were desperate, who were frustrated, who were hopeless, were treated like sardines, packed one on top of the other, even if they were disfigured, even if they were in pain, even if they were vomiting. And not only did they have no hope, they had no dignity. And the one thing that I always felt, especially in the UK, was that even if someone was dying, they died with their dignity preserved. And I came back and spoke to my parents. And of course, we decided together, which is unusual, because my father usually decides, <laughs> that we should do something about this. And if you look at this picture, you will see the thinker, the doer, as well as the mover and the shaker, I'm not talking about Andrew Simkin, <laughs> who decided to build something basically that removed the sardine effect, that removed the hopelessness, that removed the lack of dignity, and injected brightness, peace, harmony, and space into cancer care. Huge investment, but worth it. And today, you have what is probably the largest, complete, and easily the most expensive cancer unit in this country, 
in one roof. There is no necessity for anybody to go anywhere else for anything. And there is no necessity for them to feel hopeless because, as Dr. Ajit Pai said, cancer is curable. And in fact, it is better for you to have cancer as there is less risk of you dying in 20 years than there is if you have renal problems or cardiac problems. And the game changer, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to radiotherapy, is none other than the true beam, the greatest warrior in the battle to cure cancer. Now, what is radiotherapy? I'm only an orthopedic surgeon, so that's why I was given the true beam as something that I had to talk about, not just because it was another baby of my mother's. It is because radiotherapy is not as difficult to understand as what Ajit Pai does or what the oncologist does. It's relatively simple. Of course, it has all these steps before you actually administer the therapy. But the most important thing is that basically it means that you're destroying cancer cells using some rays. You could use gamma rays or you could ra use rays that are charged like protons or electrons, depending on the type of cancer. And obviously, you would have to decide how much of these you were going to use, depending on whether the cancer was superficial, or whether it was deep, whether it was large, whether it was small, whether it contained oxygen or didn't contain oxygen. And the so-called superpower to treat cancer using radiotherapy was something referred to incredibly, even though it was actually quite a primitive piece of equipment, as the cyber knife. And the problem with such a machine was that it took four hours to treat you. You needed 40 times to go to it. And you had to be strapped down like this. Now, I have already looked at various members of the audience, and every one of you have changed your head position at least three times every minute. Now imagine if you can't move for four hours. Imagine if you have a cancer in your throat or in your chest and you can't move. You're locked down like this for four hours. Imagine if you have prostate cancer and you're not allowed to visit the little boy's room for four hours, even though you've got a huge tumor sitting in your bladder. It's ridiculous. There is absolutely no dignity nor is there comfort in such therapy. Further, it's not as if this machine fle is flexible depending on the tumor. The tumor has to suit the machine. So you can't have a tumor that's too deep. You can't have a tumor that's too superficial. You can't have a tumor that's too big. It has to be just the right size. And more importantly, radiotherapy is not some cuckoo clock treatment. It is very dangerous treatment. You're burning the body. You're setting fire to the cells. You're destroying DNA. There is no way during this treatment for you to know where the actual bit that has been treated is located. You know before the treatment where it is. You're assuming that in those four hours your target has not moved out of position because you've strapped that patient down like he's being tortured and you're assuming that you are hitting it every single minute of those four hours and you only know whether you've destroyed normal tissue after four hours when you check the patient again in a separate machine. This is completely unacceptable. That's what I thought and therefore I made a video recently which is available on YouTube where there was a full length shot of me next to the true beam with me explaining its virtues and the first comment that was posted there was a young girl saying what an amazing piece of equipment and the immediate response by my IT team was please darling get your eyes off the piece and look at the radiotherapy machine <laughs> so I would, re re I would require that the ladies in the audience and the men who are that way inclined to take your eyes off this piece of art and instead focus on what is, ladies and gentlemen, seriously the fourth dimension. 
what a robot has no capability of doing, the true beam can, and that is intelligent therapy. The true beam can assume the shape of the cancer. The true beam can follow the cancer. The true beam can detect and enter the cancer and stay with it while it moves and not touch even one hundredth of a millimeter outside that cancer while it kills it. It is truly a true warrior. Now if you look at this picture, the cancer could be located anywhere. It does not have to have the shape of a square or a circle or a parallelogram. It could be any shape and anywhere and the true beam will tackle it. It may be in the neck, the true beam will not touch any nerve, will not touch the spinal cord. You will not have any derm nerve damage. It may be in the jaw, the true beam will not touch the salivary gland. You will be able to digest your food and you will be able to swallow. It may be in the prostate and the true beam will not touch the water pipe. So even while it destroys the cancer in the prostate, you will have normal urine and sexual function. And more importantly, it may be located near the trachea and every time you breathe, every time the windpipe moves up and down, it will not touch anything but follow the movement of the windpipe up and down. It may be in the liver and as the diaphragm or the muscle that separates the stomach from the chest moves up and down and the liver moves with it and the tumor moves up and down, the true beam will follow it without touching anything that may be normal. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, it could be dynamic. Your cancer could be in the chest moving all the time and the true beam will only kill the cancer and not touch a single element or strand outside the location of the cancer even while you are breathing. And every 15 seconds while you are treating the patient, you can actually see which area of the patient has been treated up to one hundredth of a millimeter. This is four-dimensional technology. And the technology is so intelligent that if by chance your cancer moves out of the path of the true beam, it will completely switch off and wait till it comes within the target area to fire again. So all kinds of treatment can be given by the true beam, including the most modern gated rapid arc, which basically, Lucy and Jack, is like playing your PlayStation, where you lock on to your target and then that's it, it's dead. It cannot survive because you have locked onto it and the cone beam focuses onto it and kills it without destroying anything else. Yes, it does not have any problems that the conventional older methods have. You can treat the smallest, the largest, and 40 sessions become four sessions, four hours become 15 minutes, and it can treat cancers anywhere with whatever dose you want. More importantly, even if you have cancer in two or three locations in the body, they can be treated simultaneously and you can even irradiate, it, irradiate the entire body. So there's no doubt that the true beam has taken technology from the bullock cart that it was to the rocket science that it is today. And there's no doubt that it comes very close to being almost as important as me as a baby to my mother. So what kind of medicine do we actually practice? A lot of people seem to think that doctors like me practice some kind of mumbo jumbo, that it's hit and miss medicine. You go there with chest pain, they give you a drug. You go there with a broken hip, they say you have to have surgery. You go there with a you know, worn out knee, they say total knee replacement. Is it mumbo jumbo? It's not. We practice what is called modern scientific medicine. We don't practice man, uh, magic. What we practice is evidence-based. No treatment in this hospital is prescribed unless there is evidence to show that it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't exist at Miot. So unfortunately, we don't have massage, we don't have dance, we don't have creams and powders 
and ointments. We only have evidence-based medicine. And evidence-based medicine is used to cure cancer because it can. You can kill cancer with radiation therapy or combine the radiation therapy with chemicals or combine it with surgery to actually cure it. So who decides whether the therapy is right? What if the person has prejudice? What if the person can be bought? What if the person is not well informed? What if the person does not have cutting edge information? What if he's not up to date? We have a tumor board. We have 10 hand-picked, dynamic, current young minds led by none other than George Chandy, who is a remarkable erudite, articulate leader, almost as good as me, <laughs> to make sure that there is concentrated, focused treatment and it is evidence-based. And not only that, out of the 10 permanent members, they have 35 full-time specialists. They meet three times a week, they discuss cases, they are impartial. This is probably the only hospital in India where we work as a team and we actually like each other. You'll notice that four-fifths of this auditorium is filled with Miot staff who we didn't invite. They're all here because they want to be here. And none of us, management, had to call them to come on stage. They love each other. They love being up here. They love to work. They're here full-time. No one works anywhere else. They come at 6 in the morning. They work till 6 in the evening. And unfortunately, to their, unfortunately for, their, for their wives, they're married to Miot. And this medical board meets three times a week and decides on evidence-based medicine, just like the rest of Miot does. And this medical board, unlike the usual corporate hospitals, the environment of hope to everyone who needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prithvi. That was brilliant. Thank you for taking us back in history. Some of us didn't know some of that. And thank you for taking us real time, bringing us to where we are today. Thank you very much. We have a brief presentation for you about the Institute of Cancer Cure put together by Asha, Deb and Radhika. Despair. A diagnosis of cancer feels like the end of the world. The search begins. Which cancer center offers you the best chance of a cure? Introducing the Minyot Institute of Cancer Cure, MICC. In most cancer centers, the patient comes to one area to find out what is wrong with him, whether he has got a cancer or not. Then the patient may need to see a particular specialist who is specialized in that kind of cancer for which he has to wait. Then that specialist may send him for another special test in some other place. And then, after that, he may come back to the same unit where they decide again that they need to send him elsewhere for chemotherapy. And the patient, during this period, is running from pillar to post. And, above all, he has not built a relationship with anybody because he's been running from one institution to the other. In most cancer centers, treatment is fragmented. On the other hand, the Mayotte Institute of Cancer Cure brings